Hey there, movie buffs. Ever heard of the film Coma? If not, you're in for a treat. This 1978 thriller is packed with funny, shocking, and sad facts that'll keep you glued to your screen. But what makes this movie stand the test of time? What makes it such a memorable part of cinematic history? Picture this, you're sitting down to watch Coma for the first time. The suspense, the mystery, it's all there, drawing you in from the get-go. And as the plot thickens, you find yourself on the edge of your seat, wondering what's going to happen next. Now, we want to hear from you. What's your most cherished memory or personal experience related to this classic film? Share your stories and memories in the comments below. We can't wait to hear from you. So, buckle up and get ready for a roller coaster ride of emotions with Coma. And remember, there's plenty more where that came from, so keep watching. The movie from 1978, Coma, left a big mark on the movie world. It got people thinking about what's right and wrong in medicine and kept them on the edge of their seats with its exciting story. Even now, its ideas about power, dishonesty, and the tough choices in medicine still matter. People loved watching a young doctor discover a secret plot in a hospital, and it made them wonder if they could trust hospitals. The movie's scary feel and gripping story still grab attention today, making it a classic that keeps people talking about healthcare and morals. In the making of the movie, background artists took on the challenging role of portraying coma patients suspended by wires in the clinic. Their physical strain was so intense that filming could only occur in six-minute bursts. To manage this, special tables on jacks were crafted for the actors to rest between shots. Director Michael Crichton explained the complexity, highlighting that the suspension was from hips and neck, requiring the actors to act as if suspended everywhere, putting a significant strain on their backs. 16 real people and 15 dummies were used, with the camera capturing mostly the genuine individuals. Adapting the film from its source novel brought notable changes. Dr. Susan Wheeler, the central protagonist, transformed from a feminist blonde medical student in the book to a second-year surgical resident with brunette hair in the movie. The film downplayed the feminist content present in the novel, except for occasional arguments between the main couple. Additionally, the Medical Institute building's location shifted from the city in the book to an outer suburb in the film. The movie's tense moments, particularly when the main character is pursued through the hospital, are underscored by a reverberating piano chord. This distinctive musical cue would later be borrowed in the original Friday, the 13th the following year, becoming a notable element in the horror genre. The film's unique challenges during production and the significant alterations from the source material contribute to the distinctive nature of the 1978 movie, bringing a blend of technical innovation and narrative reinterpretation to the screen. In an interview with Millimeter Magazine, the director of the film shared his intention to explore the genuine fears people harbor toward surgery, the prospect of perishing under a doctor's care, and deep-seated anxieties about hospitals. Michael Crichton aimed to present these fears in a manner that allowed the audience to enjoy them as scares, without delving into more profound and realistic concerns. During the production, all scenes featuring coma patients in the clinic were shot in two versions. One depicted them semi-naked, while the other, tailored for television screenings, showed them covered up. Notably, a two-part television miniseries remake of the movie, produced by Ridley Scott and Tony Scott, was slated to air on the A&E Network in September 2012. These details offer insights into the director's approach to portraying fears surrounding medical procedures and hospitals, the careful consideration given to different versions of scenes, and the subsequent adaptation of the film into a television miniseries. In the late 70s, a film unfolded with Michael Douglas in a leading role, later to star in the 1994 adaptation of Michael Crichton's novel Disclosure. Douglas, known for his roles in films like Love Story and The Hospital, once characterized this movie as a blend of both, with suspense elements reminiscent of Alfred Hitchcock's style. Interestingly, Michael Crichton, the director, had penned novels under the pseudonym Michael Douglas, a fusion of his first name and his brother's. Within the narrative, Dr. Moreland slipped during a session with Dr. Harris adds complexity. Confidentiality fractures, unveiling Dr. Wheeler's romantic entanglements with Dr. Bellows. This revelation contributes to the overarching theme, hinting at the hospital harboring unsettling secrets. The plot thickens, suggesting that beneath the facade of medical professionalism, something isn't quite right. The film navigates through the murky waters of ethical breaches and suspenseful undertones, offering a gripping portrayal of a hospital with more than meets the eye. The word coma comes from the Greek term coma, which means a deep sleep. In a certain story, the male character was initially named Berman, linked to comedian Shelley Berman, but the actor chosen didn't match that ethnicity. 
so the producer changed it to Murphy, reflecting a Boston Irish background. It's interesting to note that Ed Harris began his film career in that role. The switch from Berman to Murphy made the character's background more authentic, aligning better with the actor's portrayal without changing the essence of the character. This adjustment shows how small changes can enhance the story's setting and context. Casting Ed Harris turned out to be a great decision, marking the start of his successful career, demonstrating his talent right from the beginning. These tweaks in adapting a story for the screen aim to create a more engaging experience for the audience. Changing the character's name from Berman to Murphy is an example of the attention to detail in filmmaking, where every element contributes to a cohesive story. This transformation underscores the flexible nature of creative decisions in bringing a novel to the big screen. It highlights the collaborative efforts of writers, producers, directors, and actors in crafting a cinematic experience that resonates with viewers long after the movie ends. The movie from 1978 features a notable cast, including one Oscar winner, Michael Douglas, and four Oscar nominees, Genevieve Bugel, Ed Harris, Rip Torn, and Richard Widmark. Michael Douglas is seen driving a Fiat 131 Mercury Special, which was equivalent to the Brava in the US market. In one short scene, mostly in the background, and with his back mostly to the camera, Ed Harris appears. Tom Selleck's part is little more than that of a cadaver. Both actors would shortly shoot to stardom in long careers, approaching a half century each. In the movie, Tim McIntyre talks during the trailer for its release in the US around the middle part, DRS. Bellow and Wheeler, played by Michael Douglas and Genevieve Bugeld, are shown watching a Cincinnati Reds game on TV. The commentator talks about sending Johnny Bench in to home plate. This scene helps set the stage for how the characters interact. Interestingly, more than 10 years later, actor-producer Michael Douglas worked on a similar kind of movie with Joel Schumacher's Flatliners, a sci-fi horror medical thriller. In 1978, a film emerged with notable characteristics that set it apart. Michael Crichton, in a Modern People article, highlighted the significance of spotlighting female achievements, leading to the casting of Genevieve Bujold in the lead role. One distinctive feature of this film is its deliberate withholding of a musical score until the 45-minute mark. This choice, defying the conventional reliance on music, adds a unique layer to the viewing experience. Additionally, the movie marks Sue Bugden's debut, introducing a fresh talent to the cinematic landscape. These elements collectively contribute to the film's distinctiveness, offering viewers an unconventional narrative and an introduction to new talents. In summary, the film's casting choice, the delayed introduction of a musical score, and Sue Bugden's debut all contribute to its distinct identity in the cinematic landscape of 1978. Each element serves a purpose, enriching the overall viewing experience. In 1978, the movie marked Richard Widmark's 30th anniversary as a movie actor. His presence added depth to the film, showcasing his extensive experience in the industry. The role of Dr. Susan Wheeler could have taken a different turn, as Farrah Fawcett, committed to Charlie's Angels, missed out on the opportunity. This casting twist brings an interesting layer to the movie's what-ifs. Julie Christie, initially the first choice to portray Dr. Susan Wheeler, could have brought a different dynamic to the character. Her potential involvement adds a layer of speculation and curiosity about how the narrative might have unfolded with her in the lead role. These behind-the-scenes casting decisions offer a glimpse into the alternative paths the movie could have taken. Each actor's unique contribution could have shaped the film's narrative in distinct ways, making it a fascinating exploration of the movie-making process. The actor Lance Lego, known for his role as the assassin Vince in the film, later portrayed the persistent Colonel Decker in the hit NBC television series The Ateen. The film featured a memorable scene of a coma clinic where numerous men and women were suspended by wires attached to their wrists and ankles, a striking image used for the movie's posters. Producer Martin Ehrlichman, inspired by the source novel, aimed to evoke primal fears of hospitals, akin to what Jaws did for people's fear of the ocean. He emphasized how hospitals, unlike the ocean, are unavoidable, heightening the phobia. 